I'm just waiting for, yeah, I think I think maybe we can start. So uh, Siddharth Goel is going to talk about going serverless with Django on AWS Lambda. So over to you, Siddharth. Thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, as uh, explained, I'm Siddharth. And this the topic for our today's uh, talk is going serverless with Django on AWS Lambda. So uh, what you will see in this talk. I'll be briefly talking about serverless computing. Why is it for you and the benefits, disadvantages of it? Then we'll talk about deploying a web application in a serverless computing platform. The things to look out for, we'll have a live code demo for the same. And to conclude, I'll talk in brief about API gateways and their role in serverless deployments. So let's get started. Serverless computing, what is it? So serverless computing platforms are a type of service offered by major cloud vendors like AWS, Azure, etc., wherein the cloud provider manages the machine resources. This is in contrast to a traditional uh, service like, say, uh, EC2 server, wherein we pre-provision the resources ourselves. So why? Uh, as we all know, a lot of work in IT has gone into ensuring that operating system hardware is abstracted so that developers can focus on writing business logic code. Serverless computing platforms are a manifestation of this. And as we can see in this, as we move from infrastructure as a service to say function as a service, which we are talking right now, more and more components of the stack are abstracted to the vendor. And the serverless platforms today are mostly function as a service offerings, wherein we as a developer only have to focus on writing the business logic code. Now, one of the biggest points to note in serverless platforms is they are event driven. So unless uh, only when they are requested, an event is generated through which the serverless computing platform runs and it in theory downscales uh, to zero. So it has a lot of differences when we think of deploying a traditional web application like uh, a web service or an API on a serverless platform. We will be discussing these differences in the session later on. Now, you might be wondering why should I bother with it? Like I'm fine with my Docker containers. So one of the biggest advantages of serverless computing is since more layers are abstracted, the less you have to manage. The only thing that we manage here is our business logic and secondly, if your application has a lot of variance in terms of usage, like it needs to upscale, downscale a lot, then again, serverless computing platforms uh, are very cost effective because we only pay for our current usage. We do not pre-provision future uh, usage right now. But this is not always completely true. For example, uh, like say, if you have a very high usage uh, without a lot of variance, uh, sustained uses then a traditional uh, computing platform will be much cheaper than a serverless option so uh, in today's uh, talk we uh, i'll be mostly demoing it uh, the things on aws lambda uh, but a lot of advantages disadvantages things to look out for are common across most of the offerings by different major vendors so you should be able to take learnings from here and work with vendor of your choice now, what are differences in a traditional or a serverless deployment? So first difference is that you do not have com fixed compute resources. Now, since you do not have fixed compute resources, your code has to be has to ensure that it does not rely on any of these. For example, uh, memory caching. Uh, a lot of us sometimes use memory cache uh, in our web services or, our, or in our APIs because traditional deployment, the service continuously runs. But in a serverless computing environment, the application has the potential to completely downscale. And in that case, you will lose the memory cache. Similarly, uh, a file system. So since the components are so abstracted by the vendor, we do not have access to like a typical file system that we might have in a, say, a containerized deployment. And another difference, which I think is a big disadvantage of serverless deployment would be 
that the deployment strategy is a little vendor specific so what does what do i mean by that again like say for example i have a web application and i have containerized it in docker uh, if i make a docker container i can pretty much deploy it to kubernetes kubernetes offerings of any major vendor without any issues but in a serverless platform since again the so many components are abstracted by the vendor each vendor has its own methodology of how it takes that application and runs it so your deployment strategies have to be tweaked for each vendor now uh, things to look out when specifically making a web application so as an example i am using django but since most python common web frameworks follow wsj request response flow you should be able to again uh, use this thing for say a flask application so again the biggest disadvantage in my view is that traditional serverless platforms they mostly do not provide the web service gateway interface request response object flow as we all know uh, like in a traditional web application so like when i say run uh, I, i make a django web application and i say run server so the endpoint that is exposed from from the from your browser or say your client to your web service the request is converted to a wsj request and the application returns a wsj response the gateway acts like as a bridge between your client and the application so in a django application on serverless platform you will have to add another layer between like the client and your wsj wrapper Uh, another thing since again the application has the potential to downscale completely so latency is a big issue here you have to ensure that your application starts as quickly as possible again this is not an issue in traditional deployment even if my web app takes a minute to uh, start it won't be much of an issue uh, for this point also uh, we have an example coming up later in the session uh, a sample example so things you can do to make it faster third point would be uh, linking to external services since the again the platform has the serverless platform deployment has the ability to upscale and downscale rapidly so if you have an external service like say a database those applications will make individual connections a lot of individual connections to that database and it might lead to performance issues there so you need and it's a good practice to have a proxy between the application and the database so that proxy can manage the collection pooling and your database doesn't get clogged up okay so now uh, we'll start with the code demo so guys uh, i have a simple web application here uh, it just has a, it it has a single web page and it displays data from the nasa data api uh, the this one it's a pre public api so uh, i'll just quickly walk you through this application uh, anyone who is even a little familiar should be at home with this so uh, we have two app modules the, uh, the source folder has all the code by the way uh, and we have two app modules sample and stars the sample app module uh, contains standard django files asgi.py wsgi.py uh, these files are wsgi app initializers uh the urls.py this is the base router for the whole application and this if as you can see i have just routed every route to the stars app uh the settings.py uh, as django standard dictates this file contains all the configuration for the whole application this custom storage.py file this is uh this is not a standard uh django file and we'll look into it later why is it here now coming on to the stars application so in here again uh, pretty simple just a single url path uh, the slash path reda uh, redirecting to the home page view function single view function home page view function which just uses this helper file to fetch data uh, if to fetch data from nasa apis and renders the home page html page with the context data of that so pretty straight forward and for a demo purpose only uh, i have a single static file which is just a logo for the application 
Now, this is a very simple and straightforward application. Uh, I do not use any database, etc. And if you see, and I run it. So this is our application. This is uh, astronomy picture of the day as told by NASA, one of their most popular APIs. And this is just a Windows plot for the Mars Insight Station for the last available SOL data, which is SOL 656 yesterday. So as you can see, a simple Django application, I can run it very simply uh, as you would uh, any other Django application. OK. Now we will uh, go and check AWS console. OK, so first I'll introduce you to what is a simple Lambda function. Then we will connect it to an API gateway. And then we'll see what is that event thing that we have been talking about from the start. So let's create a Lambda function, say icon live demo. Runtime is what language runtime you want to run it in. Let's select Python 3.6. And for those of you who are completely unfamiliar with AWS, so each service object, like say this Lambda function, inherits a role. And role has proper uh, permissions attached to it. Permissions can be simply like ability to access S3. So this project will inherit those permissions. So as you can see, it gives a standard boilerplate code for us. It's a simple lambda function.py file. And here we have the function, which has two variables taking event and context. Let's log this event and see for ourselves what is it. So I'll just save this. And we have successfully saved it. Now let's connect it to an API gateway. Uh, for uh, people who have not heard of it, API Gateway is simply, as the name suggests, a gateway through which you can link your external environment, say the internet, to your internal services, like say a Lambda function, or you can use it to proxy pass to another HTTP endpoint, etc. I'll again lay, uh, name it Icon Live Demo. We shall create it. So as you would say in uh, an Nginx, you would uh, give routes, like for example, what to do when you get a slash route. You can specify routes, methods, etc. So let's create a, any method, like any method allowed. And the integration type. So as I was talking, it allows you to connect the external environment, internet, to an to a internal service. So you can have a Lambda function, which we will use in our case, an HTTP endpoint, an internal VPC link, etc. So let's select the live demo that we just created. Save it. And there we have it. We have integrated it with that Lambda function. So thankfully, AWS provides a console internally to check out to like test this API. So I'll just make a simple get request. And we get a response, hello from Lambda. If we see here, the code here is also hello from Lambda. Now let's see what is this event that we just logged. So this is these are the logs for this Lambda. We didn't log it, I think. OK, yeah. OK, so we have it. I think it didn't load it the first time. I was scared. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, so here we have the event. Let me copy it and prettify it for everyone so that everyone can see it easily. I can just get it copy correctly. Yes. I have that. 
so here we have it as you can see it contains a lot of keys but the things to note so it has a request context key which has the path and it has the method through which we have called and if we were to make a post request it would even have the body and correspondingly if you see so it has pretty much every standard information that you have in a http request and it has all of these so what we have to do to deploy our simple web application to lambda as i told we have to convert this event to a wsgi request and then take a WSJ response and return it back in a format that this understands, which would be this kind of format. So this is one of the trickiest part in deploying a web application to Lambda. Properly converting this event to the WSJ request. Again, if you can do this, uh, you can deploy like a Flask application also because that also uses the same standard. So now let's see here so there's a thing called handler in a lambda function this is basically what file name you are calling and what function in it it will call so as we can see here the file name is lambda function and the function name is lambda handler so on a similar note uh, we have another file a lambda handler file in it the function name is also lambda handler so what i do here is i take the WSGI app object import it from the Django application that we have this is standard Django application then we create our own function which takes this application the event that we get from lambda and return the proper response so now let's look at this function so we come in here and uh, for those who are completely unfamiliar with like a uh, WSJ app, let me go here quickly and show you guys. Yeah, so what this function does, it, it returns a WSJ handler class. And if we just go here and check, so basically what it does is it, it has this properties for the handler which loads your whole code and takes this over that class and returns the WSJ response. So basically, what this will expect as a parameter, you can say, is this environ, which represents like the request information, and the start response, which represents the response information. So taking this knowledge, again, here also, we create our own response object and we generate the environment from the event this part is basically converting what i told converting that event to wsj request format and this part represents converting that wsj response to the standard response expected by lambda this api gateway first let's look at response this is very simple so we have a start response class therein we have this response function which just takes this output uh as a variable as a parameter this output would be what the wsj response object it parses it and converts it into a format which is suitable for api gateway uh, and this again can be used like say a flask application now for the environment part so here we have a function and in this function we basically convert we take that event body and convert it into this format. This is the standard environment format or the request data, you can say in layman terms, which the WSJ application expects. So herein, I parse the headers, the path, the body, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the code that basically enables uh, us to run this application to uh, Lambda function and now deploying it to lambda so as i told the deployment is a little tricky vendor specific so how would you deploy it so lambda exp expect self-contained code block so what do i mean by self-contained code block is that you have your requirements you have every file in there so this is a simple shell script which allows us to deploy to lambda so again very simple we go into the source folder 
we install the requirements in the target dot and target dot would entail that all the requirements are installed in the source folder itself so that it can becomes self-contained block we will look into later what this line is for we make a zip file and we upload it to the function and the function is pycon demo test and suppose i run this Uh, in the meanwhile, we can check out. So in my repository, I have added a continuous deployment step using GitHub Actions, which does the same thing. So this would be the configuration file for this. In here also, if you see, it's quite simple. We check out all the code. We set up Python 3.6. Then we run a simple script, which does what? It again installs uh, like updates pip goes into that folder, installs requirements in that folder for a self-contained package. Uh, we look into this line, makes a zip. Then there is this action which basically takes that zip and uploads it to the Lambda function. So let's see if that uh, is done, yeah. So this was successfully updated. Now let's see. Yes, this updated 39 seconds ago. Similarly, uh, I have made an API just like we uh, saw right now. This does what? This also uh, links to that API. Here it is. And it is deployed live on the internet uh, with a specific stage. Please go here. And here it is. So pretty straightforward again. It's just converting that event to this. Now, another thing that we saw that I talked about is reducing the latency. So for you, I have an example. So uh, people who are familiar with content hashing, so we will be doing that in Django. So quickly, if I can just tell what's content hash is basically, uh, suppose I open this URL and let me reload it. Let me hard reload it. Hmm. Yeah, so this fetches some J CSS, JSS files. And if we see here, this is the star image that uh, I showed you guys here in the static files. This is that sta same star image, this logo thing. But if we see the path, the path has this string like between the star image and PNG. So this is content hashing. It, it is basically a way to invalidate static assets cache. Now, Django has the ability uh, to do this by itself, there is this mixin which is called manifest file mixin, which Django Storage's static files app itself has. And uh, like, say, if we couple that with S3 Boto3 storage, which is from the Django Storage's package, what this does, this allows us to create a way through which we push our static files to AWS and serve them through that place. And as we see here, the, yeah, it's, uh, sorry, moved it. Yeah, so as we saw here, this is from uh, S3 bucket. But so what, what it does, like when we do this collect static command that we saw this, so here so what this does it takes all the static files collects them to a place takes the content of those files makes a hash out of it so if you change the file the hash will be different and the application will fetch the new file itself and makes this json file which is like the manifest file so django uses this file to fetch to know like for 
suppose this path i have to fetch this api from the uh, static file source so traditionally what will happen this file yes. will also be pushed to yes, s3 so that, so, sorry to interrupt uh, just a time check we just have about 5 minutes yeah okay. no problem so however uh, what i have done i have overloaded these two functions which are basically for reading and writing the manifest file and they write it into the local file itself so this manifest file becomes a part of the package so in a traditional deployment loading this file won't be an issue when you start the application but this reduces latency by a lot when we uh, make this file a part of the whole package itself so these are small small things that uh, one can do to reduce the latency and it's very crucial you do that in a uh, serverless deployment next uh, i'll just conclude with a little bit about api gateways so as we saw the demo and the created we the created gateway also api gateways are just the initiators of the event of a serverless function so there are of course multiple available gateways from different vendors some of them are even uh, open source like part of them are open source like say kong but the crux remains the same they all have ability to call the uh, static to call the serverless functions but the differences arise in the events so unfortunately i cannot show you the event uh, like a live demo of kong but uh, i have an event of it i think somewhere yeah so this is like the json of a kong event as you can see again we have similar we have all the information for request we just have to convert this one also to a whj request object and our app will be able to run so guys that's all from my side today uh, the code is available for uh, publicly on this uh, on my github and feel free to connect with me on the zulip chat or Uh, through any of my social contacts thank you uh, do we have any questions yeah thanks sir that was a great session yeah we do we do have questions so there is one about lambda so he hey, can we get access to the git repo for this django aws lambda i mean yeah experiment i guess yeah we uh, guys uh, i'll share it on zulip Uh, for everyone the repository is open and the deployment pull request is also open anything okay. else I, i guess there are a lot more questions but probably you could take them on zulip meanwhile yeah, let's sure. just ask you a general question so uh, why did you go with aws why not you know gcp or azure mm -hmm. uh the basic difference is that uh, aws i thought was Uh, more familiar to me but i have tried azure especially azure has azure http functions which make this converting event json to request object a lot easier so there are of course plus and minus of different vendors whatever you are comfortable with the basics remain the same uh -huh. that's that's nice to know and uh, lambda can in general be used for any any kind of real time or near real time compute right is that right yeah yeah so that also again has a whole new topic in itself like uh, hot scaling down scaling but yeah you can i see that's nice it was nice talking to you uh, siddharth and uh, the i'm sure the audience really enjoyed your talk uh, very thanks. interesting one thanks a lot thank you everyone